Good evening. I am Baina Jeffries, Chair and Associate Professor in the Department of African American Studies. My introduction remarks will be followed by our lecturer, and then we will leave time for Q&A. If you have questions for our speaker, please post them in the chat, and we will get to them during the Q&A portion of the program. On behalf of the Department of African American Studies, Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and the Women's Center, I would like to welcome Dr. Beth Ritchie to Ohio University for our virtual spring event. Dr. Ritchie is head of the Department of Criminology, Law and Justice, and distinguished professor of Black Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The emphasis of her scholarly and activist work has been on the ways that race, ethnicity, and social position affect women's experiences of violence and incarceration. Focusing on the experiences of African-American battered women and sexual assault survivors. Dr. Ritchie is the co-author of a newly published book titled Abolition Feminism Now with Angela Davis, Gina Dent, and Erica Miners. She is also the author of Arrested Justice, Black Women, Violence, and America's Prison Nation, which chronicles the evolution of the contemporary anti-violence movement during the time of mass incarceration in the United States. She has also published numerous articles concerning black feminism and gender violence, race and criminal justice policy, and the social dynamics around the issues of sexuality, prison abolition, and grassroots organizations in African-American communities. Dr. Ritchie, welcome. Thank you so much. I am uh, thrilled, really thrilled to be here. To be here in the midst of a hostile society a society that wants our labor or our death. We live in pursuit of justice, in pursuit of freedom, and longing for a bit of grace. How shall we live? How shall we treat each other? How do we treat our compatriots, some of whom are guilty of crimes against us? That's a quote from Farrah Griffith, her new book, asking us really important questions that I think frame our discussion this evening. So I greet you in peace and humility. I am uh, invite you into this space tonight, uh, seeking answers to questions about uh, how we should live, how we should work, how we should study, how we should organize and parent and publish, how to build resistance movements, and how to care for each other. Um, how do we do all of those things, living fully, in a way that is in pursuit of justice, freedom, and love. It's really a privilege to have been invited to the Department of African American Studies at Ohio University. I love the range of co-sponsors for this event, uh, illustrating the kind of interdisciplinarity that I think spring lectures ought to embody. I wanna thank all the people who had the vision for this event, all the labor that went into it. We had an amazing tech call before. There are lots of people uh, watching out for us um, and that labor makes this event possible. Uh, Professor Jeffries, I wanna especially thank you um, for your perseverance, for making sure that this event happened and hopefully will happen smoothly. And then thank you for all of the people who are here in attendance. However you found your way here, I'm really honored to be sharing this space with you this evening. The sense of honor that I feel is paralleled uh, by a sense of urgency. For just as we are here this evening, of course, others are not. Uh, some are barely surviving on the dangerous streets of Chicago or living in homes across the state of Illinois, having experienced another day of brutal violence. Others aren't here because they're held in local jails or prisons, um, some in custody for some of that violence. And if we look closely in the corners of those cell houses, we'll find survivors, criminalized survivors, whose participation in violence was coerced by their male partners, by police officers, or by prosecutors. Um, some of them are there because of unresolved trauma, uh, the kind of trauma that's associated with substance abuse other self-destructive um, behavior. Some are there because they used aggression to protect themselves from harm. Uh, some are there perhaps because they weren't able to protect their children from violence. Some are there because they're trans people 
women and girls hidden from our view, trying to survive the hostile, inhumane conditions in the jails, in the schools, in families, in halfway houses, in immigration facilities. Or there are brothers and sisters who are hiding in fear because of the hateful legislation that we see permeating um, houses around this country, legislative space around this country, criminalized because of their identity or how we choose to love, locked up and secured congregate living facilities for people with disabilities. And of course, of course, people aren't here because they're being held hostage in their own home. Indeed, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of women, girls, trans people in harm's way as we gather tonight. And I pause to mention them, to say their names, to explicitly invoke their uh, pain and suffering, their survival, because I believe that until they're free, none of us are living right. I pause to open our hearts and minds to them to invite those yet not free into this space as my first act of abolitionist talk. Um, I'll try to integrate ideas of abolition throughout this talk, feminist abolition, black feminist abolition, really to kind of model a scholarly praxis that attempts to be inclusive and expansive and dedicated not only to principles of academics, but also the pursuit of justice. So my second pause, uh, we're still in the warm up here, is a trigger warning. I, as I bring those endangered people's memory into this space, I realize that some of you may also be living close to the experience of gender violence that I'll be talking about. You may have survived violence directly or vicariously in public spaces and community agencies at your university, in your hospital. You may have witnessed it in your families or even just be feeling some particular kind of way this evening about the violence in New York City or in Milwaukee or in the Ukraine or in the other countries that the media is ignoring. Please find support and take care of yourselves tonight. Take a break if you need to. Uh, I won't know if you've gone away. Find someone to talk with, keep an eye out for each other, both here and online. And if you get nothing else from this presentation, remember that what we need to build in order to be free is a community that cares for each other. As we seek answers to the kind of fundamental questions that Farah's work reminded us of, how to live for justice, for freedom, with love, we must center care in the middle of all that we do. We're the ones we've been waiting for. We have to create communities of accountability, even when it feels like we're in hostile places or we're living in difficult times. We have to be intentional about how we're doing our work, whether it's re research, teaching or speaking, caring for children or our aging parents, organizing campaigns to close prisons. We have to do that work with care. If we're studying for midterms, planting community gardens, counseling survivors of gender violence, whatever we're doing, we have to be intentional about the goal of liberation at the center of our lives and care as a methodology to bring that liberation. So that's the second abolitionist praxis, living every day according to our values, fighting for freedom. Indeed, I've titled my talk this evening, Black Feminist Reflections on Violence and Mass Criminalization, The Promise of Abolition. The Promise of Abolition. But I could have called it, How Anti-Violence Activism Taught Me to Be a Prison Abolitionist, or How We Won the Mainstream Political Movement for Gender Equity, but we lost the movement against gender violence kind of cautionary tales about carceral feminism. I'll get to that in a minute. Here I wanna say that each of these titles suggests that I am gonna to try to pack a lot into the time I have with you. Hold on. Um, my orientation is clearly as a black feminist and I, I claim that not to the exclusion of other perspectives but more to share it as a broad frame that I think is an inclusive one. Um, it's clear, I hope, from my talk, I hope you came because you care about anti-violence research and policy work and the need to protect people who experience it. Um, you may not know, but hopefully you'll know by the end that I see that as not just service work, 
but also radical social justice work, that is to respond to the violence, we have to also work for freedom. And then in order to do that, I think abolition offers us the best promise. So I speak to you this evening as members of the um, Ohio University community, students I'm assuming are here and faculty, staff, uh, maybe some civic leaders or community organizers, agency executives, anti-violence activists, perhaps, policymakers. I wish I could see you and know who you are. Uh, maybe some of you are culturally specific interventionists. Uh, some of you are survivors, I'm sure. Um, but I also want to invite you to come into this space, leaving those kind of official identities behind. Come into the space thinking of yourselves as freedom fighters or peacemakers or justice workers. Think of yourselves as trying on the identity as an anti-oppression activist or protester, a human rights worker. And mostly, I hope you'll begin to think about the possibilities of yourself as an abolitionist. From here, I think it's important that we can look at the potential transformative work that we can do in black studies, in women's studies and anthropology, sexuality studies, that all of those um, disciplines need to come together to fight uh, the forms of violence that we are experiencing in our lives, all the violence that we're experiencing, and not only to fight against that violence, but to build the world that we want and to go about making that world from a place of care. So I'm not talking about studying it only or reading or writing about it or arguing about it, uh, trying to understand it or watching it on the news, describing it to ourselves and others as scientists, scholars, neighbors, parents, consumers of media. Uh, I'm asking us to broaden our focus, whatever our focus is, to think of ourselves as justice workers so that we're not just arguing against the violence, but we're engaging in changing the world. As we think about engaging, changing the world, I'm going to be clear that what I'm going to try to do is make the case for abolition. And not just the case for abolition that we heard arising from the burning cities and the closed down um, communities, the uprisings that we saw two years ago, not just that case for abolition but the broad case of abolition that has been happening for years, every day in social movements and in community-based spaces, the radical vision of abolition, the feminist vision of abolition. I wanna make that case because it's important that we think not just about what we're doing now today about defunding the police perhaps, or campaigns to close prisons or release strategies. We're not just talking about that. I'm not just talking about that. Instead, I'm talking about a long-term strategy for change. Now, I'm gonna try to organize that case, the case for abolition, in five different frames, if you will. The first frame is the one that allows us to look at the profound and persistent harm that's caused by gender violence. That's my starting point. The second is the lens that allows us to look into the buildup of a prison nation. The third is how that buildup, once we see it, once we see how the prison nation has been built, we can understand the process of criminalization, use that word in my title, and how that process of criminalization is directly linked to carceral feminism, the term I'm gonna define, and how all of that can be responded to by a black feminist abolition praxis. That's where I'm gonna conclude. So how does that broad case look? Now I'm using my work as an example in this spring talk. Uh, my work on uh, my work against gender violence in the lives of black women and trans people. I invite you as you're listening to substitute your work. And your work, no matter what it is, should allow you to figure out the frames 
that will take you to the place, I hope, where you can think of engaging in abolition praxis as part of your solution. Now, I ask myself a series of questions when I take this broad frame. And I think these are general questions, regardless of what your work is. The first question is how does racial identity, sexuality, class, culture, and gender become sources of danger and vulnerability for members of our communities? In my case, I ask how do those things in combination become sources of danger and vulnerability for black women and girls and gender non-conforming people at the societal level? Kind of a macro set of questions. Then I look at a micro set of questions. So those people at, who at the societal level are experiencing danger and vulnerability, who are also experiencing very particular forms of violence in the intimate sphere of their lives. That's the micro level. And how that vulnerability at the societal level and the micro level work together and leave people in danger targeted by America's prison nation through that criminalization and what can abolition offer us. So the need to start with broader questions, abolitionist-oriented questions, for me, didn't come from my training as a qualitative sociologist or my years working in criminology over 40 years now, but really came from my work with Black women survivors uh, working in community-based programs. Those questions came from the teaching that I do of men mostly black men at a maximum security prison in Illinois, Stateville prison. Those questions came from facilitating a support group of trans people in the local jail where I live and from engagement with organizations like Insight, Women of Color, Women and Trans People Against Violence, an organization called Insight, an organization called Love and Protect, the National Network for Women in Prison, BYP 100, black and pink, I could go on. The reason I'm naming those places and identifying those organizations is to invite, especially the younger scholars in black studies or in um, gender and women's studies, in any discipline really, I'm asking you to think about where you can learn, seek out opportunities to gain some wisdom, beyond the walls of your university, beyond your classrooms, beyond your training grants and the institutes that are provided, beyond even talks like this, places where you can find the wisdom from those people who are most affected about how to change the world and what needs to happen for them to be free. That's another abolitionist praxis. Indeed, I know most of what I know because of the work I've done beginning 40 years ago alongside people who were trying to do racial justice work from within the context of gender justice. But before I get to that, I wanna share with you my origin story. This is a genealogy in some ways. When I began working as a young social worker, I was living in New York City at the time, in Harlem, which is a community renowned for its commitment to activism around issues of racial justice. Um, housing, the economy, education, voting, the environment, healthcare. I felt honored and humbled to be working alongside people who had a vision of freedom that necessitated dismantling structural racism. For me, it was kind of a heady, radical time confronting anti Black racism and capitalist system of domination at that time in New York City. Some of you may know where this story is going because amid the vigorous, political debates about racial injustice, there was virtual silence around questions of gender and sexuality. The silence was not only troubling to me because gender was not included and therefore the frame of injustice was incomplete, but more importantly, it meant that women and gender non-conforming people were somehow not understood, they were erased from the discussion about suffering from structural oppression. So the political, social, economic, and um, uh, uh, policy remedies didn't include things like, what do we do when there's partner abuse from a male leadership in a black radical organization? 
What do we do when there's a sexual assault by a political activist who's leading a campaign around black freedom? How do we respond to harassment at strategy meetings in black community-based organizations? None of those questions could even be asked because of the erasure of gender, let alone how we could include gender violence as part of what the agenda was. It was as if gender inequality was not considered important or even existent by what was a predominantly black-oriented racial justice movement. That's a little history lesson. Although it should also perhaps it sound familiar to some of you who are engaged in racial justice work now. Complicating this was the fact that the emergent work to end gender violence, the opening of shelters and rape crisis centers, the anti-sexual harassment programs on campus, all of the gender violence movement work were increasingly being directed and controlled by white women. Feminists who argued for a sisterhood among us, but didn't seem to know how or be willing to look at racial difference in that analysis. Here it was if gender violence trumped every other kind of injustice, including racial injustice. False statements about solidarity prevailed. There was erasure of difference. Um, the leadership of women of color, which was the first leadership around gender-based violence in this country, was stifled, was excluded. So my story of learning about transformation and about change and about the possibility of freedom is one where I was trying to walk the line between a community dedicated to cha challenging the ways that institutionalized racism limits the lives of black people. For me, it had to include black women on the one hand, while at the same time trying to advance an analysis of gender violence that takes seriously racial inequality in order to protect black women on the other. I felt at that time that all I needed to do, to do was convince black men that gender mattered or white women that race was important. And I tried to do that over and over again for years and years. Some of you may share this history. Sensitivity training, interventions, um, reading groups. Uh, I did that work initially optimistically and with lots of hope and with patience. Some might even say with naivete. Uh, I came slowly, but now I'm convinced to the point where the only way to challenge gender violence and criminalization is to engage in changing the world around racial inequality. And the only way to fully understand the impact of pernicious anti-Black racism as we see it today over and over and over again is to complete our understanding of racism with an understanding of gender inequality. Now, some of you who are students of Black studies or gender and women's studies are gonna call that intersectionality, right? And we have lots of people who are talking about the importance of that work. I'm gonna invite you to also think about that as abolition feminism. It's a strategy that says it's important, not just important, it's essential, that the only way we can respond to multiple forms of oppression is to think about how they intersect and not just how they intersect, but how we want to build a world where they don't exist. Now, let me talk just for a moment um, about gender violence. I want to be sure to kind of ground this discussion in the pain and trauma of violent victimization. 25% of all cisgender women, 40% of all queer people experience part, uh, violence from their partners, their intimate partners, the place that's supposed to be safe. We have to understand what that means. We need to hold on to a, the realization that at least 20% of the women on your campus, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity have been raped. And in fact, many have been raped by more than one of their peers. 68% of women walking around your neighborhoods, on your campus, down your streets, will be harassed. And in many cases, that harassment will grow to aggressive stalking and surveillance. Trans women who experience street harassment will face deadly consequences at an even higher rate. And for many people, the intimate partner violence, the sexual assault, the date rape, the harassment will be accompanied by economic exploitation and abuse, emotional degradation, harassment through social media, acute socialization and long-term impairment. So the persistence of gender violence 
first frame of the five, is important organizing as, a, as an organizing um, tool for, for my analysis. And I think what's important about it is we not only understand the pain and trauma of the gender-based violence, which I know many of you um, are studying, are working, are thinking about, but also how the gender-based violence needs leads to things like health disparities because of the number of trips to emergency rooms. It leads to economic inequality because of days lost of work or school that can't be completed. It leads to erosion in families because of the number of children sent to foster care when parents can't protect them, or questions around disability because of physical injuries, suicide attempts, substance abuse, depression. Women don't vote. Women don't participate in community organizations. They aren't able to take care of their aging parents. They are locked in uh, when we are trying to figure out how to deal with the pandemic. The individual and social consequences are real and have a profound effect, not only on the individual experiencing them, but the networks of people surrounding them and the neighborhoods that they live in and the communities that surround those neighborhoods, et cetera. Of course, people with less social power, those of you social scientists and others, I hope realize this, the consequences are more serious. So poverty is highly correlated with gender violence. Poor women are poorer because they receive fewer resources. Women without legal papers are much more isolated because their so-called illegal status leaves them outside of and social services and more dependent on abusive family members. Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, questioning, gender non-conforming people already marginalized in society legislatively and socially and culturally and religiously are ignored when they're hurt or worse blamed for their violence somehow because they don't look like a real victim. And black women whose lives are profoundly impacted by that very system that we ask people to turn to when they're in danger, that very system being the criminal legal system, black women whose lives are profoundly impacted by the criminal legal system live in precarious situations. So the abuse isn't taken seriously, people are treated with suspicion, the ultimate powerful influence of the prison nation draws people into harm's way. And I want to just share a few anecdotes, stories to sort of illustrate this point. These come from uh, the book Arrested Justice and other um, projects that I've been involved in that look at how women are harmed. They're not just not helped. They're not just not helped. They're actually harmed by a particular kind of intervention that the anti-violence movement has embraced. And the first story, I opened the book with the story of a woman who I met in a schoolyard uh, in the neighborhood that I live in. And I described how there was something kind of unusual about a drive by this schoolyard because there were a number of police cars, reporters instead of children outside. It was a beautiful morning in Chicago, much like today was, but it was a very troubling kind of energy. And the energy was troubling because it was surrounding a mundane object, a trash, trash dumpster that was transformed from a simple object into a tragic site of despair. I was um, shocked by what I saw. Um, and it took me a minute to think about what I would have done or if had I known someone who was similarly situated to the 15 year old woman, black woman who had become pregnant, um, who went into labor in school, who delivered the baby by herself, who put the baby in her backpack and then put the backpack in a dumpster beside outside of her South Side Chicago High School near my home. And of course, like all of you, I wondered how she could feel so desperate. Who was she? What tragic events could possibly have led to this decision? There seemed to be no good explanation, at least from what I knew at that point. Um, when the young women's friends heard about what happened, they were shocked, both about the pregnancy um, and about the dumpster. For overwhelmed teachers who were alienated from their public school students, they were actually part of a program that brought young white teachers into two-year 
uh, teaching jobs, and then those teachers left. They were quite alienated from their students, socially distant. Her parents were distracted by the pressure of negotiating a large family's need on very limited resources. Um, and then in some bizarre, a really outrageous move, the media spun the story as part of the ongoing labor strike that was crippling trash collection in the city. It didn't take long because of that framing for the wider public to be sort of riveted by this story of the newborn who, dried, who died tragically in the dumpster. But the story was really about the stereotypical images of a young, ruthless, irresponsible, brutal, uncaring black woman who became pregnant, whose uh, behavior was heroically discovered by reporters who were covering the, the trash strike. Um, almost all of the audiences um, understood that this racialized formation of gender and class and pregnancy um, and age uh, was one that explained most things about young, black, pregnant, poor women. Um, no friend helped, no family member was available, no advocate, no official representation of the state, no reporter asked the young girl what happened. Um, no teacher intervened. All of that was allowed to be erased from the story so that no one knew that a dangerous series of episodes had been escalating in her life for years um, that led to this tragic uh, decision on the morning of the trash collector strike. No one held any adult accountable, including the uncle who had been raping her for two years, who the family protected because of his vulnerable legal status, because he was on probation. No one recognized her boyfriend's constant surveillance of her behavior as the dating violence that it was. No one accounted for the fact that she was being harassed by one of the teachers, one of those teachers from the school program that I described. Um, no one would, she felt like no one would believe her anyway. The more I learned about it, the more I became convinced that the community's marginalized status and her isolation within the marginalized community had everything to do with the death of the infant, the tragic death of the infant, but none of that became part of the narrative. And consequently, she ended up being arrested and charged and serving time for this tragic murder. It was a tragedy and it existed because we live within a prison nation where this young woman learned that in order to shield herself from further harm, she had to take care of things herself. There was no anti-violence program. There was no dating, uh, date rape intervention system. The police were not called because of the precarious legal situation of her family members. Um, there was no place that she could turn to for support. Second story is a story of a woman who I call in the book Ms. B, who was living in public housing in Chicago in a uh, complex called the, plan, uh, the Stateway Gardens. Stateway Gardens had been identified by the city of Chicago as part of its plan for transformation, for demolition. The city was going to transform itself by demolishing a thriving public housing community. It was very much related to how people were getting in and out of the city of Chicago on the main thoroughfare to the white suburbs. Um, she was living in an apartment that one evening there was a loud knock on the door. She was pushed violently inside after she opened it. She knew immediately that the people who had pushed her into the apartment were five undercover Chicago police officers who had been harassing her for months. The nature of the harassment uh, included um, forcing her to have sex with them to avoid arrest, threatening to arrest their, her son, who was a juvenile but still had a record, um, destroy, then the police officers destroying the property like the lights in the hallway, so it was a very, it felt to her like a scary and dangerous place. All of this is part of the trans plan for transformation, which inserted a particular kind of 
undercover police officers in her neighborhood. The neighborhood was abandoned at that time. 75% of the units were empty. People had been scattered around the city. The fabric of the community had been destroyed. There were no stores. There was no laundromat. There was no public transportation. She was left to fend for herself. And on this night, when the police came again to her apartment, they took her son in one room. And as she screamed for them to leave him alone after they threw him on the ground and cuffed him, they forced her into a bathroom in her apartment. They forced her to take off her clothes, lay on the floor, and effectively do an internal cavity search on herself while they filmed it with their, cam with their phone. I'm going to use the word fortunate, but you'll understand that I don't mean it was good fortune, but it was a good thing that they had filmed it on their phones because she was able to use that evidence for the brutality that she experienced from the five undercover police officers. Ultimately, her case was taken up by a legal clinic at one of the universities in Chicago. She won a very small, very small out of court settlement and has been in and out of protective custody since then because the five undercover police officers continue to work for the city of Chicago. The third group of people I wanna bring into this discussion at this point, remember I told you about the trigger warning, are seven young African-American lesbian identified women who found themselves delighted to be out on the streets of Greenwich Village, place very different than the neighborhoods in Chicago where the first young student was and where Ms. B lived. Uh, Greenwich Village is a place that has a renowned reputation for acceptance and openness, a lively street uh, evening life. And the young girls who came in from New Jersey um, were delighted to be part of a place where they felt being open in expression of their affection for each other and their gay identity uh, would be accepted. They were wrong about that because as they walked by the table of a young man selling DVDs, he's on the street, um, sort of uh, vintage old movies, many of them black movies, he started aggressively insulting and then ultimately assaulting them um, they crossed the street, he followed, they crossed back, he followed again, all of this caught on video camera. A bystander tried to intervene and a fight ensued that resulted in the young man being stabbed, two of the young um, women being physically hurt, hair pulled out and one uh, with a uh, sprained wrist. Um, and Ultimately, the young women were arrested despite the fact that they were resisting, they were trying to defend themselves. The all four, four of the seven, three ran away, four of the seven young women were arrested and served time in New York State prisons because of the injury that the young man um, experienced from their self-defense. Part of how we have to understand what happened here is while New York City and Greenwich Village in particular has a reputation of being open and accessible for a range of people. In fact, New York City, like many cities around the country, is finding itself embracing a law and order agenda, one that politicians are advancing in particularly gentrified neighborhoods to make sure that people of wealth can live there. Anti-loitering ordinances, are now prominent in those neighborhoods. Uh, security cameras that are often used to, uh, in this case, misidentify who's being harmed and by whom. Um, there's a kind of conservative rhetoric, um, anti-youth uh, sentiments. It's, it's sort of um, imbued with racist and homophobic uh, statements about who the city should be safe for. Um, the verdict in this, uh, the jury in this case um, listened to prosecutors uh, describe the women as a lesbian wolf pack um, and all and other kinds of degrading um, uh, images of them. The people who were involved in the, the prosecutor, 
uh, talked about prosecuting criminals so that New York City could welcome visitors. The media covered the case as if it was um, sort of black sexual black female sexuality kind of going wild in the city and someone needing to control it. And what's important here, as is true with the other two cases that I presented, no anti-violence activism, no black racial justice group came to the defense of these black survivors of gender-based violence. Lana, another woman, was arrested when she called the police after being raped by her boyfriend, she was arrested because she had his stolen handgun in her purse. The stolen handgun was more significant than the rape. Yvette was incarcerated for six years on a child maltreatment charge because she allowed her father's children, her children's father to see her children, despite the fact that she had a restraining order against him because he threatened to kill her and all she had was a piece of paper. But she was arrested because of child maltreatment. Tierica used her cell phone to videotape police demanding that she drop charges against one of their colleagues who had harassed her. She filmed the person trying to convince her to drop the charges, and she was charged with interfering arrest. More and more. The cases go on and on. The links between the cases are compelling and they're clear. These are Black women hundreds, maybe thousands of them, similarly situated. They're in dangerous households, disadvantaged communities, neighborhoods in transition on contested streets. Their abuse takes many form, happens in many contexts. It's physical, yes, and sexual and emotional. It happens across their lifespan and will originate from dis di different sources. And those sources are both micro level and macro level, which is why those questions were so important at the beginning. The more marginalized their social position is, the easier it is to victimize them. Um, and the more distance they are from the hegemonic norm of what a victim should look like, the more their harm won't be taken seriously. And if the harm isn't taken seriously and they're marginalized, further and further from the expectation in a court or a social service agency or a police officer, the more they'll be criminalized and punished, isolated, stigmatized, arrested um, because of their experience. So that's critically important. That's a different understanding of what gender violence looks like. That can look like that. That frame is open for us to see because we live in a prison nation. A prison nation is a place where literally 7 million people are under the surveillance and control of the criminal legal system. Um, when they're in the buildings, in a jail or a prison or a detention center or a halfway house, they're typically further and further away from home in harsh conditions without protection from COVID or rape or TB, or a mental health crisis, we have the highest incarceration rate in the world. But more metaphorically, in addition to the actual buildings and the conditions of people who are in, living in those cages in those buildings, more metaphorically, the prison nation is one where we have exported the ideology of punishment into places like schools. So we have schools where when you go to the principal's office, you're in a cell not sitting in a chair and a lot, you're in a cell. We have people who are living in locked facilities because of their disability. We have armed borders. We have security in welfare offices where people are, at one point, people were um, held accountable using administrative decisions. Now people are actually charged with increasingly things like welfare fraud. We have child protective services that isn't so much looking at the protection of children, I argue, but in fact is looking at ways to take children from families and not only take children from families, but arrest parents who can't take care of their children. That's what a prison nation looks like. And so it's this combination of the macro and micro level violence and the prison nation that has led us to the position that we're in. And part of what has fueled that criminalization is carceral feminism. So I'm going to speak now to the feminists in the audience and ask you to think about what this looks like. 
quite simply what we have done, we meaning feminist scholars and feminist activists, especially those in the anti-violence movement, what we have done is overly invested in the prison nation that I just described to solve the problem of gender violence. When we know, we know from our scholarship and our activism, we know when we listen to stories like I told you, we know that the prison nation harms black people. And yet still we have invested in the prison nation as the solution to gender violence. It's guided by carceral feminism that is, is guided by a gender essentialist analytic that says um, the criminal legal system will protect victims of violence uh, if we work hard enough to keep changing it. And in the meantime, despite what we hear from women and uh, girls of color, from trans women, from lesbians, from immigrant women, despite what we hear, that harm, that degradation, that dangerousness isn't enough for us to look for alternatives. We hold to carceral feminism so strongly that when people are victimized and they're not helped by the system, we are distracted from critiquing the system. It's not the system's fault, but somehow those aren't real victims. Carceral feminism uses this kind of gender essentialist analysis to argue that the primary problem is individual violence, one man, typically one man against one woman, and the state should intervene, and that intervention should look like more police, more legislative changes, new laws or arrest policies, prosecution, imprisonment. The solutions to gender violence and most other social problems lie within the purview of the criminal legal system. And so things like your sexuality, your race or your class, your gender identity, whether you have a criminal background are ignored. All of those other marginalizations are ignored. And so is violence from the state itself. The state will not police itself. The master's tools will not dismantle the master's house. So the result is greater criminalization of marginalized groups, including women and black trans people, when we offer up police and prisons as the primary solutions, so that on any given day, if I walk into the Cook County Jail here in Chicago, 25% of the women there, of which 95% are black, 25% will be there on some domestic violence related charge. Not because they used violence to cause harm in their intimate relationships, but because we have invested in things like mandatory arrest policy. So when the police get there, if they're called, and if they're called, if they come, and they will look around and if she has a shoe in her hand or a lamp that she has used to protect herself, she will be arrested. Carceral feminism, when advanced in response to violence, fails to account for injustice, inequality, structural violence, state use of violence, police maltreatment, and other forms of abuse for those who are most at risk. Those are all questions that abolitionists have to ask, which brings me then to my final frame, a black feminist analysis of prison abolition. Now, part of why I wanted to make sure that you understood the issue of gender violence the way that I do, I ask you to agree with it, but understood how I come at it, is because it's important that in my claims about the promise of abolition, I want you to know that I'm making the claim with a full understanding of the degradation and the harm and the death that gender-based violence cause. I don't take it lightly. I don't think it's unimportant. But I listen to Black feminist scholars like Angela Davis and Gina Dent, co-authors, like Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Patricia Hill Collins, uh, Derricka Purnell, Miriam Kaba, a lot of people who are writing about these ideas, Kimberly Crenshaw, Donna Davis, um, and they're writing as black feminist scholars or scholars of black feminism to say, here's what our um, theory of change says. First, oppression is interlocking. So that's a notion about intersectionality. Second, that individual harm occurs within a broader context of violent oppression. 
So we have to look at the root causes to understand how the structural and the personal, how the macro and the micro are connected. Third, that state power enables the violence. And so we can't only turn to the state to challenge its own power. And that we have to listen to survivors who will share everyday knowledge. We call that standpoint theory. And if we trust, let our research be guided by the wisdom of those affected. If we kind of free ourselves from the colonial spaces of formal academic research and practice and find ourselves more engaged with real people um, struggling to survive in real ways, then unapologetically, we will understand the need to move beyond seeking safety from the state to looking at the possibility of real freedom uh, and real liberation. Now, let me just try to get concrete for the last few minutes that I'm speaking and then really interested to hear uh, what your experiences are and uh, what your challenges are to this analysis. Um, so in the book, Abolition Feminism Now, uh, we talk about carceral control as being the prison nation I described. Some people call it the prison industrial complex, the long reach of surveillance. We talk about how carceral control doesn't bring safety or freedom. It might provide short-term intervention, and that's important if you're in danger, but it won't set people free. And what we know from talking with survivors of gender-based violence. What they want is the violence to stop and they want to feel free. And safety for them is linked to freedom. We've gotten it wrong. We meaning those people designing interventions. We've gotten it wrong when we think sending a person into hiding at a shelter, at a confidential place, that will be a few good nights sleep without the interruption of fear or actual violence but it doesn't feel free, important number one. Number two, so I'm repeating myself here, we have to look at broad strategies, root problems. And while we're looking at root problems, the systemic racism, the economic inequality, the school failure, we also have to focus on individual suffering and harm. Some people call it a dialectic. Some people call it both and. The point is we have the ability, the capacity to meet individual needs and engage in campaigns for justice at the same time. And we have to do that. Abolition calls us to move beyond the crisis, the emergency, to look at the possibility, the hope, the needs for a different kind of future. And it's as if we have to kind of live with one foot in the world we live in now and one foot in the world we want to create. It's divest, invest. Uh, we have to believe that there's enough. And, and there's lots of resources to do, to do this. I call your attention to the book called um, Tumbling Toward Repair. Uh, there's a really exciting toolkit called the Creative Interventions Toolkit. Organizations like Gen 5 and Critical Resistance, um, a book that I've just recently reread, The Revolution Begins at Home, or the new book by R Miriam Kaba called we do this till we free. Learn from the web presence and the campaigns of Survived and Punished or uh, Love and Protect, API Chai. There's lots of organizations that are actually doing this on the ground. They're taking small steps. They're making mistakes, but they're trying again and again. They're building organizations, connecting people, not just tearing down, but really building up communities. And that's the prison abolition case that I hope uh, I invite you to step into with me. It's understanding that our work as scholars isn't just academic work. It's also got to be healing work, feminist work, racial justice work, community work, as well as scholarly work. We need to write and read about real alternatives that move beyond relying on the carceral state to solve the problems of justice, to transform safety, understand what freedom could really look like develop policies and strategies that reinvest in communities, bringing our best resources and our best thinking back to the places where people are suffering the most. Um, Derricka Purnell in her new book uh, on abolition, Becoming Abolition, talks about how if we understand the historical uh, notion of abolition, um, 
you know, the W.E.B. Du Bois notion, the um, early abolition of slavery kind of idea, we'd stop asking, well, what is that really going to look like? Because what we'd remember is people who were fleeing slavery, they weren't knowing where they were going. They were turning around and saying, I'm leaving that. I don't know where I'm going, but it's got to be better than here. And I'm going to try every route I can to get there. We need to embrace that um, movement toward abolition to say, we will try over and over and over again to be free. And we will carry each other along, resolve harm, deal with tension, take wrong turns, but we're walking toward freedom. We're gonna build serious coalitions um, and collaborations with other justice movements on that pathway to freedom. We're gonna to listen to the stories along the way, base our work in real, time. Um, we're going to learn from all of the various disciplines that we can, sociology and philosophy and media studies, and we're going to try to understand even the complex topics like racial capitalism or cultural representation, um, queer studies. We're going to write through pandemics. We're going to make sure that gender is included in uh, activism around uh, racial justice uprisings. And, and when we do that, when we do all of that, responding to harm, courageously thinking about what alternatives might really look like so that we don't leave people in harm's way because of things like carceral feminism that we're so attached to. When we do that, our scholarship will be better. Our students will be better trained. Uh, our dissertations are going to win awards. Our policy will be more effective. All that's important. But more important, uh, our Black studies, our feminist studies will be more accountable to their origins, where they came from, which is struggle. Our work will be more relevant outside of the academy. And our future, not I mean our academic future, but the future of our people will be closer to freedom, closer to freedom. We'll be there to catch that baby when Tanya has it. We'll protect those communities like Ms. B looked, lived in. And we'll celebrate love wherever it's expressed. Goodness knows we need more of it. Abolition offers us the possibility of that freedom. It's done in a way that responds to what people need, but also uh, what people deserve. Um, it did in the past. Uh, we can trust that. Um, and I believe it will in the future. And I'm delighted to have shared ideas about how we might do that together. So thank you for your attention. Well, oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Thank, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I would like to thank Dr. Jeffries and the Department of African American Studies for organizing this uh, event, which was as inspiring as it is necessary, um, something that I think we absolutely need. Um, and so I understand that we are open for questions, so I invite um, any of those. And, and just to get us started, Dr. Ritchie, you um, had this phrase in the beginning that has stuck with me at every turn, which was, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And it reminds me so much of the communities that we need to build, but also a community here right now having these conversations with each other. Um, and so I wondered, just as a broad question mm -hmm. for you, I think we we tend to, and I'm a, I'm a criminologist as well, so oh. <laughs> the criminal legal system is there always. And I think that part of the reason we end up De almost defaulting by nature to a carceral response is because there's this ID, there's this notion that it leads to accountability, right? And right. accountability was thrown in throughout your, was peppered in, I should say, throughout mm -hmm. your talk. And so I wonder, could you just spend a minute just explicitly defining what accountability means for you and perhaps even referencing one of your examples, what, what we could, a strategy in that light that could yeah. help us think differently? Yeah, thank you for that question and thank you for um, moderating. That's not always the easiest job, but I appreciate uh, I appreciate you in that. Um, let me pick up on a couple of things you've said. I'll ramble a little, and then um, you know you'll tell me when I've gone too far or something. One one thing I think is important is you know as an abolitionist. 
I really believe, I hope this came across, that we um, have more power than we think we do. And part of why I believe that is I have seen what I call everyday abolition happening for years in anti-violence work. If we turn around and talk to people in our neighborhoods, talk to people in our families, most people don't rely on the criminal legal system to solve the problem of gender violence. In fact, they don't rely on the legal system for most problems, especially if they have an alternative. And so, yeah, we take somebody in when they need a place to stay. We uh, go out and say, stop that noise when someone's making too much noise on a Saturday night in the evening. We um, help people cross the street. I mean, there's things that we do, and I'm. these seem like small things, but the, cumulation, the accumulation of those kind of acts, some people are calling it mutual aid now, which is important to lift up kind of as a, again, a theory of change. We can do more. We already do a lot, and we don't need to rely on a state system that uses harsh punishment as decided by people who are often very far away from the place where the harm happened to bring justice. And I think, um, I, 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 I think it is important to recognize then when we feel hurt, when we feel um, a violation, we often want something to happen to the person who, ca who caused or we think caused that harm. It feels like kind of a human instinct to do it. Um, but there's pretty good research that once you do that, you still feel hurt, you still feel angry, you don't have your things back that were stolen from you, either like metaphorically or practically. So the, the criminal legal system doesn't bring the kind of accountability that actually makes people feel better. It sounds good. It's initially um, therapeutic, but it doesn't restore anything back to what people need. And it does nothing to address the concentric circle of people who are harmed. So even if it, you know, doesn't do anything to make the neighborhood feel safe, um, even if the person who wasn't harmed might feel like at least they're gone, right? So the idea of accountability for me is more linked to transformative justice, where we say, okay, a really bad thing happened, and we have to figure out how to take care. You know, that's why I talked about care. We have to care. We have to care about it and we have to provide care for it. And as part of that care, we have to listen to who was hurt to find out what would make them feel whole again. And often what would make them feel whole again is, you know what, I never felt whole in the first place. So how do we not say make feel whole again, make whole for the first time, perhaps. Like, and sometimes that's things way outside of whatever the harm was. The Creative Interventions Toolkit does a beautiful job of saying step by step by step, um, here's how you can employ a, restore, a, a transformative justice approach when, been, um, when there's been harm. Uh, just practice, I wanna lift them up as another example of an organization. They have a hotline you can call and say, this happened. What's a transformative justice approach that could lead to accountability? You know, so I think there are people who are trying to uh, bring that accountability um, into real time for people. And the last thing I'll say about it is I, I think um, accountability has become a word that is like, punishment light, not um, restoring or transforming uh, harmed community or people to a better place. And, you know, I know from talking with some of my students, for example, at um, Stateville Prison, the times that they felt most accountable um, not necessarily for what they're there for, but for things they've done, harm they've caused in their lives, is when they had to be accountable to something that meant something to them, their family, their religious community, their children, um, each other, not the state, not the state.
And to be accountable to like the state is so far removed from what so many people's experiences that we, ha we, we got to get it kind of close to people's heart more. Yeah. So it's kind of a rambly answer, <laughs> but I wanted to, you, your question prompted those other thoughts to me. The rambly answers are always the best because there's so much <laughs> that gets worked out. And I'm reminded so much in that of how you really make tangible the promise of abolition, right? You know, so often um, it feels like this far off thing, right? It's this, it, and it is in some senses a future goal, but it, it's not just it's not trapped in the future, it's happening right. now. And, and so maybe perhaps um, a question that can be asked now that isn't, that'll take us a little bit on a tangent, but we're yeah. all members of a university and yeah. universities reproduce often the same harms that you've discussed here, the same yeah. race and gender and class-based inequalities that we see are replicated in the structure of who gets to go to college and mm -hmm. who, um, and who doesn't, um, is there anything that you can speak to about, do you see a radically different university in the future that falls in line with the promise of abolition? What a good question. Um, and in part, you know, full disclosure, I am, you know, head of a criminology program, right? And we're a huge program at University of Illinois Chicago. We have almost 800 undergraduate majors, 50 graduate students. A lot of people want to study criminology, and what I've learned is they want to study criminology for a whole host of reasons. Um, I'm also on the faculty of our Black Studies Department, which is a much smaller department, maybe true, you know, it's true kind of everywhere. Uh, but there's kind of a consensus about why we're doing Black Studies. The same is true with the Gender and Women's Studies program on our campus. So part of what, um, part of what I think about your question is universities aren't like one monolithic thing, at least no university I've been affiliated with. And so part of the dynamic, the interdepartmental dynamic, the hierarchy that exists in the institution, the professional versus the academic centers, the interdisciplinary programs versus the old time science labs, you know, there's, 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 um, there's subgroups within the university that that are it's always important to note. Um, so that's just one thing that that occurs to me. I, I have been very impressed with the work that's being done to decolonize the university. Um, you know, I've, it's not something that I've had a lot of time to sort of study, but the opportunities that I've had to discuss with people how we are reproducing hierarchy by having, you know, our community colleges and then our four-year institutions and then our graduate students and undergraduate students, our public universities and our private universities. I mean, all of that is, um, you know, sort of emblematic of hierarchical structures that have become very difficult to change, let alone what's actually being taught inside classrooms. So it's both the structure and the process. And I think the people who are talking about decolonizing the, the university are onto something. Um, I, uh, one of my co-authors has made a very compelling case uh, that higher education should be free. And that if it is in fact the promise of opportunity, why would we stop free education at the high school level and you know and say it's free up until a point we're going to create a class stoppage at some point and then we're going to like then it's not free it's both not free in terms of cost but it also becomes selective and so it a philosophy of education becomes inconsistent with you know sort of how we think about education as a social value in this country and then um you know colleges and universities. So let's get next to why, what that contradiction is and what we need to do about it. Um, I also, you know, it's been very important for me to teach at public universities. I think the privatization of universities is very problematic. Uh, it's speaking of accountability. 
Um, public universities have lots of problems too, but I think at least we have a mission to stand by when we're making demands of our administration that has to do with access um, and it sometimes works. And so, you know, in the short term, maybe we need less private universities and more public universities. And that allows me, since I work for the state of Illinois and the state of Illinois has a commitment to public education, it allows me to make a claim for why I should teach at Stateville Prison. Those are citizens, they have a right to education at the same time. So, you know, it's sort of um, a long answer that if we're not part of the solution, then we're part of the problem. And I think many academic institutions stand back too far from the problem. And I think then we are doing harm when we're not engaged in change. Yes, I love that. It's the the epistemological violence of it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. We have a question. We'll take us back to the to um, we'll take us back to the main focus of the talk. Um, this one comes from an audience member who says, can you discuss how restorative or transformative justice can be practiced and implemented? How are survivors centered differently in trauma-informed and victim-centered care and justice systems? Trauma-informed, yes. Victim-centered, yes. TJ and RJ. Um, Anti-violence activists talk, use those words a lot, don't we? Trauma-informed, victim-centered, uh, transformative justice and restorative justice. Um, those words mean a lot of different things to different people. Thank you, audience member, for the question, because what it allows me to do is say that the risk of, and so I'm going to go a little bit beyond the question, and then I'm going to hopefully circle back. The risk of co-optation at this particular moment in time, given the rhetorical claims about abolition, and I would say transformative justice, restorative justice, trauma-informed and victim-centered, are very high. The risk of co-optation is very high. And so I want us to talk about what we mean, not use those words, which I think is what you're asking. So I appreciate that. Trauma-informed for me means sort of alongside victim-centered means that nothing about us without us. Uh, we are the ones we've been waiting for. It has to be by us and for us that we not only deserve the right to determine what would help us, but we have the power, if given the space, to do that helping. And so it's not a kind of thing we learn in social work school. I'm a social worker, so I can talk about social workers a little bit. Um, it's not the kind of practice that we learn in school. It's the kind of approach that we take to, or a theory of change, if you will. It's a praxis of engagement with those most affected to say that's where the wisdom is. That's where the creativity is. That's where the possibilities are gonna, are gonna come from. And our job is to, our job meaning, uh, you know, it, when we're in the position of being able to have some power to support some resources, is to sit back and and be ready when people say what they need. Um, I'm glad that people are talking about victim-centered work again. I think there was a time when early in the day of anti-violence organizing, when we were doing um, support groups that included political education and, and organizing opportunities, not just therapy, that's when I think people felt better quickly and left whatever our space, our therapeutic space was and went out and helped some other people, right? And so the fact that we're talking about being victim-centered again is good because we were down a path where we were had completely professionalized. And if you hadn't done 40-hour training with renewal every such and such a year, then you couldn't even, and you had to be out of an 
abusive relationship a certain amount of time before you could be a counselor. There were all kinds of professionalization moves that were talked about being victim centered again. If it means not about us without us, then we're headed in the right path. If it means that victim centered or trauma informed uh, only sort of lands in a rhetorical spot, then I think we get distracted from the carceral implications of that. And I think the same is true for TJ and RJ. Some of you may know that um, recently in the, the Violence Against Women Act legislation that passed, there's a provision for restorative justice. And, um, you know, there are many people who are restorative justice practitioners who think finally we're going to get some funding too. You know, it's not just going to be the more um, sort of carceral police law enforcement response. But the problem is that when the Department of Justice, and by the way, I just met with the amazing people at the Violence Against Women office. They are on our side. We are going to, it's going to be better. We've got some people, but it's the Department of Justice. And when the Department of Justice talks about restorative justice, they're talking about something different than what we're talking about. Just like when schools talk about restorative justice, it isn't always about restoration. I mean, the first, I'll just say quickly, the first restorative justice session that I went to uh, was run um, at a hospital uh, by restorative just people who claim to be doing restorative justice. And the, the person who came to the meeting to process was a person who had been sexually assaulted by a person who worked in the hospital. She worked at night. And um, so, you know, she could, she didn't feel comfortable going to work. It happened in the parking lot. What are we going to do? And the, I was observing the discussion and the, the facilitator, so-called, uh, suggested that the restorative justice response should be that she should never have to walk to her car alone at night. And the person who caused the harm should have to come to the hospital at night and walk her to her car. That that was the... And anyone who knows, I mean, you don't even really have to know very much about sexual violence. You know, that would be the last person that she would feel safe with. So his, his um, restoration was to provide safety when he had caused tremendous harm to her. Now, that's maybe an exaggerated example. But I think if we look closely, we will often see that restorative justice, when it doesn't understand context, when it doesn't listen to what a survivor needs, when it doesn't um, include how power uh, over people lasts longer than the immediate harm. Right, so I've, I've gone on too long about that. And, and I guess I would just say that I think the promise of transformative justice for the reasons that I talked about earlier um, are brighter. And I think that, um, Beyond Criminalization at Columbia University, Just Practice, which is a national organization, and the Creative Intervention Workbook, which is available easily online, will give some concrete answers to how to do it right. Not just call it the right thing, but actually do it right. <laughs> yes, the action associated with the idea, yes. the theory and practice combined. I love that. And I, and I, I, we are running up on time, so I, we have a couple more minutes until that. Um, it's about uh, 2 till 7.20 at this point. I know that I wanted yeah. to give Dr. Jeffries a chance to come back and say, wrap up. But you, you, I love that you answered with some of these concrete organizations. You've mentioned some brilliant work, brilliant other scholars, your co-authors, uh, Miriam Kaba, who my students are reading this week. So that was good. exciting. Oh, good. And, um, but um, uh, Derek Parnell, and I, I just wanted to end on one final question. Um, what are you most looking forward to for the future mm -hmm. of this work? What do you, what is the the thing or the things you don't, don't have to keep it to just one, but yeah. what are you most looking forward to? So I, feel really excited and really hopeful. Uh, I haven't always. I really do now. I feel like um, I was very worried after the attention to um, 
police violence, sort of, you know, the, the ebb and flow of that. I felt after the racial uprisings, we were going to lose momentum about attention to state violence. And um, what I feel like has happened in a way that kind of surprised me a little bit, but has is that there has been continued people who are willing to do the slow work of building abolition practice. And I feel really um, relieved and excited about that. And I feel like some of the noise about it has gone away. And the reality underneath that noise is to me very, very, very hopeful. I think in particular, the work around criminalized survivors, the campaigns, and, I, and here I'm gonna lift up again, um, survived and punished, the campaigns all around the country to get survivors who have been criminalized for their attempt to live. Um, the freedom campaigns are perfect examples of abolition praxis because, and they're feminist and they're anti-racist. And they're examples because it means, yes, we are trying to get her out, get her home. But while we're trying to get her out through a clemency campaign or whatever, a pardon, whatever we're doing sort of in the system, that legislative work, we're also making sure that when she comes home, it's a better spot than it was when she left. That's the transformative part. And we're also getting lots of people involved so that more and more people understand the issue, so that there's this kind of growing thing that's happening. And I think the underlying work around abolition, the work around criminalized survivors, the young people that are taking this issue on, that people like you are teaching this in a classroom, that Miriam Kaba has made her way there, uh, really that you've invited her there. I think we're onto something. I really do. I feel like we're not gonna turn back. And, um, and it's slow, difficult, frustrating work that um, will not bring, you know, the end result in our lifetime, but it sure feels good to be on that path. Yes, thank you so much. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I, I appreciate all of your insights. It's it's wonderful to hear your voice and your thoughts on these issues that I think it's it's so helpful. And I have to just end on just thanking you again for, for making tangible this promise mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's. Um, I wish I could see you. I wish we could have a different kind of interaction, but I have deep appreciation for your attention. And for wherever the, these ideas land, um, I hope it's uh, with an open heart. So thank you. Absolutely, excellent. All right, I'm trying to think if, if Dr. Jeffries is coming back. Hello. Yes, thank <laughs> you, Dr. Richie as well. Thank you so much, I enjoyed your talk. I know others who are watching also learned a great deal. I wanna thank our audience for your contributions. I wanna thank uh, Dr. Ningard for her contributions for the Q&A. Yeah. And lastly, I wanna thank our co-sponsors again, uh, Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the Women's Center, UCM, and the College of Arts and Sciences. So thank you so much and good night. Thank you all.